In the last video, I motivated onion routing and gave a physical analogy with nested envelopes. The way that onion routing attribute is implemented in practice is through the use of encryption. And basically what encryption allows you to do is achieve this concept of nested envelopes, but in the digital realm. Now Tor stands for the onion router and represents one implementation of the onion routing paradigm. The Tor network itself basically comprises a bunch of systems. And these are typically called uh, Tor nodes. And so imagine we have uh, two parties and we'll call them again, Alice and Bob, like we did in the last video. And let's say that Alice wishes to communicate with Bob. What Alice will effectively do is if she wants to send a message to Bob, she will pick a few of these nodes. Let's say she picks three of these nodes and let's, uh, let's uh, label them and put different colors. So these are the three Tor nodes that Alice picks and actually be a bit more precise. Uh, Alice is not doing this. Alice's computer is doing all this work. She's typically going to have some software on her computer that handles all of the underlying mechanics here. And what is going to happen is that Alice's computer is going to, in succession, negotiate shared cryptographic keys with these three Tor nodes. Now I'll talk a bit more about what the purpose of these keys are, but the main thing I want to point out is that this key negotiation process is done in succession so that aside from the first node, the rest of the nodes aren't aware of Alice's involvement. So imagine that, that Alice will get, uh, essentially, she'll get three keys from this process. So let's say she'll get the key K3 from this first Tor node. Okay. And then she'll get the key K2 as a result of negotiating with this, the second Tor node. And she'll finally get the key K1, the key K1, after negotiating with the, the first or the last Tor node, so to speak, this final Tor node. Now this is again happening in succession so that really Tor node one here will know about, about Alice. Uh, Tor node two, when the key negotiation happens, only essentially sees Tor node one uh, in this process. So it thinks it's really communicating with Tor node one, but it really is indirectly communicating with Alice. And finally, Tor node three uh, thinks it's communicating with Tor node two, but in reality, the originator of that conversation is Alice. And through that communication, Alice will apply cryptographic techniques to get these three keys. Now, I won't go into the underlying mathematics of how this key negotiation phase occurs, except to say that it actually leverages a well-known technique in cryptography called the Diffie-Hellman Key Exchange Protocol. Uh, let me actually write that down so, so you are aware of it if you want to look it up. The Diffie-Hellman uh, Diffie Key Exchange Protocol and actually it combines the Diffie-Hellman key exchange protocol with some techniques in uh, a field known as public key encryption, public key encryption. And that combination of Diffie-Hellman together with public key encryption is really what allows Alice to negotiate these keys with the Tor nodes. But at the end of it, Alice has three keys, K1, K2, and K3. Now what Alice is going to first do is she's going to take her message to Bob and, and let's, uh, let's mark that in yellow. Okay, and let's say this is the message she has with Bob. And she's going to encrypt that message uh, with the cryptographic key K1. So she will basically apply a mathematical transformation with the key K1 uh, to the message to obtain what's known as a ciphertext. And maybe I'll take a step back here for just a moment and really introduce some of the underlying nomenclature. So first of all, encryption is just a mathematical transformation of a message. So it, there's a, you can think of it as a, a, a transformation really as a box of some sort. And, and the box is going to have some mathematical operations in it. The input to an encryption algorithm would be some type of a message or payload, uh, as well as a key. And then the output of the encryption process is what's called a ciphertext. It's really an encrypted text. And the idea is that the transformation is designed so that if the key is unknown, it's hard for someone to obtain any information about the plain text from the ciphertext. In other words, ciphertext conceals any relevant information about the plain text. Now, if the key is known, let's say the key were known, then it turns out there's a corresponding operation, which we call uh, decryption. And decryption will basically also take in the key as input and will take in the ciphertext as input. And through decryption, you can then produce the plain text. And, the idea is that the decryption basically reverses the process of encryption, but again, it's designed so that nobody should be able to decrypt a ciphertext 
unless they know the underlying key. So the secrecy of the key is very critical. It's very important. It's sacrosanct, in fact, in cryptography to ensure that the key is at least kept secret in this process. So kind of going back to our description of onion routing. So Alice will first take the message M that she wants to send over to Bob. And let's assume somewhere in this message, maybe there's a an indicator somewhere that says this message actually is intended for Bob so that uh, at some point that is realized. She will encrypt the message to Bob with the key K1 uh, to get back a ciphertext C1. Uh, then she will take the ciphertext C1 and she will re-encrypt it, uh, but this time she will re-encrypt it with the key K2 to get back a ciphertext which we'll call C2. And then finally she'll take this last ciphertext C2 and she will encrypt it one more time. She'll encrypt it one more time and this time she will use the key K3 to encrypt this ciphertext and she'll get back a third final ciphertext which we'll call C3. So essentially this ciphertext C3 is a triply encrypted ciphertext. It has been encrypted really multiple times, starting with M to C1 to C2 to C3. So this is a nested uh, type of encryption. Now along the way, as she encrypts these different ciphertexts, Alice will also include information about who is going to be involved in handling or really forwarding that ciphertext. Where does that ciphertext get forwarded to? So the last ciphertext, as, as you'll see, the last message ultimately goes to Bob. Uh, the message that goes really um, the, the C1 message, okay, and I want to be clear about this, the C1 message will include in it the identity of the last Tor node. So we're just going to uh, put this in, we'll call this node N1, it's going to be easier to do it backwards sometimes. And, and let's say the the second ciphertext will also include information about the node N2. And the, the third ciphertext will ultimately uh, include information about the node uh, N3, which is the first node to whom Alice will be sending information. So really the first thing Alice will do is she's got this now C3 as well as N3 and she's going to send this combined payload, this C3 together with N3, and she's going to send that information over to this first Tor node in the network. Okay. Now remember that this node, as you mentioned earlier, has already negotiated a key K3 with Alice ahead of time. There was a key negotiation process that we discussed and so this node will be able to apply the decryption transformation to the ciphertext C3 because this node happens to know the, the final key K3. And so as a result, this first Tor node will be able to decrypt the ciphertext C3 and get back in the process the ciphertext C2 together with a node identity N2. And so it'll see this, this encrypted blob. It won't know anything about what's inside of C2, but it will know because it sees N2 that the ciphertext C2 is going to be forwarded over to the node N2. Now the node N2 is going to see this ciphertext C2. And remember, node N2 has already negotiated the key K2 with Alice. And so the node N2 will be able to decrypt C2. And in the process of decrypting C2, the node will basically obtain C1, which is the, the first ciphertext, as well as it will also obtain information about the final node uh, N1, to whom this ciphertext must be sent. So this final ciphertext C1 will be sent over to node N1. Node N1 will take C1, and remember node N1 is negotiated key K1 with Alice ahead of time, so it will be able to decrypt C1 with the key K1 to get back the original message M that was intended for Bob. And so at the end, this node, this node N1, will know the original message M that was intended for Bob, and it's going to see that this message has to be sent over to Bob and it will go ahead and forward that message to Bob, who was the initial intended recipient of that message. So what I want you to notice here is that the Tor nodes here effectively form a chain between Alice, who is the source of this message, to Bob, who is the ultimate final recipient of that message. Alice is on one extreme end of the chain and Bob is on the other extreme end of the chain. But none of these individual nodes, none of these three Tor nodes here, actually knows or has visibility into the entire chain. Each node only has visibility into its own uh, local link, if you will. So for example, this middle node only knows about the first Tor node and the third Tor node. The first Tor node, this one in purple, knows about Alice and knows about N2, 
And this final Tor node only knows about Bob and also about N2. But none of these Tor nodes actually knows about both Alice and Bob simultaneously. And this lack of knowledge about the entire chain is effectively enforced through the use of cryptographic techniques like encryption uh, with these keys that we talked about, as well as some of the underlying key negotiation techniques I mentioned earlier, like public key cryptography and the Diffie-Hellman key exchange. Hopefully that made some sense. Before closing out this video, I want to make a couple of quick remarks. Uh, first of all, onion routing implementations like Tor can cause a lot of latency. Uh, it will take a lot more time for Alice and Bob to communicate via Tor because of all this negotiation and then all of this encryption and decryption and all this communication involving intermediate Tor nodes and so on and so forth. Even something as simple as Alice viewing a web page that comes from Bob's web server, well, that will take a long time. And that is really the trade-off you make. You're basically, you're trading off privacy for latency. You'll get enhanced privacy, but you pay for it uh, using latency. Uh, the second comment I want to make is that the security of Tor is really predicated on the idea that these individual Tor nodes will not compare notes. When you think about what's happening within Tor, essentially these nodes are receiving layers of encrypted text and each node is essentially peeling off one layer of that encryption using a key that it knows. It's like peeling off the layers of an onion, which is really how the terminology or nomenclature or onion writing came about. But if these nodes were able to somehow compare notes with each other, if they were able to look at each other's logs, or for that matter, if somebody had access to the logs at all of these different nodes and knew how they all operated underneath and it could compare what was going on at each of these nodes, then it would be theoretically possible for this uh, entity to be able to put all the pieces together and tie Alice to Bob. What's really protecting Alice and protecting Bob is the hope that no one entity is able to look at all the different layers of the onion simultaneously, so to speak. But having said that, it is still within the realm of possibility that one Tor node or one entity can somehow control or know what's going on in multiple Tor nodes concurrently. So to help mitigate the risk, what Alice will typically do in Tor is perhaps try to choose uh, intermediary Tor nodes that are geographically widespread, so it's maybe less likely that they'll be in cahoots with each other. Alice can also choose to use more nodes. For example, instead of using just three nodes, she can use five nodes, with the idea being that it's a lot harder to imagine that maybe all five nodes are controlled by one entity or that one entity has access to all five nodes compared to, let's say, having access to just three nodes. I'm going to end this video right here. Hopefully this video and the previous one provided you with some insight into the concepts of onion routing and Tor.